Well, welcome to Drilling Deep. I'm your host, John Kingston, and this is the place on FreightWaves TV and among FreightWave podcasts where we drill deep into talking about oil and diesel, and we drill deep with a guest of the week. This, week's it, this week, it's Alberto Del Pilar. He's with the boutique investment company of Butcher Joseph. Butcher Joseph recently was involved in turning a Midwest carrier rapid response from a family-owned company into an employee stock ownership plan known as an ESOP. He's going to be here in a few minutes to discuss what that entails and why an ESOP can be a good idea, pro and con. On to oil. I've been involved in oil, covering oil for a long time. You can date it back to 1985 when I joined Platts, which then was part of McGraw-Hill. Platts is now part of S&P Global, uh, which is what McGraw-Hill really morphed into, and Platts is part of the S&P Global Commodities Insights segment. Just a few years, I guess eight years before I joined Platts, Marathon Oil built a oil refinery in Garyville, Louisiana. It was a greenfield plant, meaning it was built where nothing was there before. And since then, there have been no new refineries, no greenfield refineries built in the U.S. There is one under construction in North Dakota. It's a relatively small plant of less than 50,000 barrels per day, but it's really a function of the Bakken production up there. The fact they have natural gas that's otherwise maybe stranded, and they feel the economics on that can work. It's really an aberration. Let's talk about Garyville. Garyville was 200,000 barrels a day when it opened back in 1977. That North Dakota facility is about 50,000 barrels per day. The fact that no big refineries in the U.S. have been, the fact that no refineries have been built in the U.S. every so often pops up as an issue in U.S. politics. It's usually dripping with nationalism, all sorts of, we can't build anything in this country anymore, shtick. And I can tell you right now that this is a pointless exercise. It has nothing to do with economics and nothing to do with good energy policy. It usually has everything to do with politics. This issue got another boost in recent weeks when O'Leary Ventures chairman and Shark Tank author Kevin O'Leary said he was going to put together a group to build a new refinery in the U.S., he put a $14 billion price tag on it, no capacity. And his comments on it were pretty much what you would expect. He said, I'm going to syndicate that debt and that equity. I'm going to find a state that wants to work with me. I'm going to get a permit, and we're going to do the right thing for America. We have to have more refineries. There's no doubt that being brash and bold has created a lot of great visionary companies in America. But O'Leary seems to think on this one that he knows more than the world's refiners do about refining in the U.S., and he is going to make a new refinery work where other companies have balked. Note, I didn't say other companies have failed, because anybody really who looked at building a new refinery in the U.S. over these many years has stepped back from the abyss before actually building one. First of all, there is a fascination with shiny new things. Outside of that small refinery in North Dakota that's under construction, it's supposed to be open this year. It's true, we have not had a brand new refinery built since 1977. As I mentioned, Garyville, that last new refinery, came online in that year with a capacity of 200,000 barrels per day. You know what the capacity down there is now? It's more than 550,000 barrels per day. It's, a, it's 275% bigger than it was on the day it opened. Those expansions have come over time. So what if the expansions didn't happen at a new refinery? Who cares? What's the difference? There have been refineries that have closed, no doubt about it. Bruce Springsteen fans will remember that in the song Open All Night, Bruce sang about the New Jersey Turnpike and the red ball rising over the refinery tower. You know how many operating refineries there are in New Jersey now? One. If you are on the turnpike, it's right near the Gothels Bridge exit and it's run by Phillips 66, but there used to be a lot more. But U.S. capacity is hung in there. The Energy Information Administration reports a weekly number for operable refinery capacity. It doesn't change every week, but it is subject to shift every week. At the start of the series, back at the beginning of 1990, it was 15.7 million barrels per day. Right before the pandemic hit, it got up to close to 19 million barrels per day. It's back down now to about 18 million barrels per day, so we have had a loss. But the point is that even building no new refineries, we tacked on 13 million barrels per day in capacity by 2020 from 1990. 
and it's only slipped back by about 1 million barrels per day. And I see no indication in the data that the EIA is yet counting ExxonMobil's 250,000 barrel a day per expansion down in Baton Rouge that it brought on just last month. There's no surge in the data to suggest that that facility is in there when a surge is there in the real world. And let's not forget that the U.S. makes about 900,000 barrels per day of ethanol, and that displaces gasoline. That is absolutely U.S.-based refining capacity, and yet it is one more fact that makes this whole we need a new refinery nonsense a total joke. The U.S. also is increasingly making a few hundred thousand barrels per day of renewable diesel. Granted, some of that is coming at sites that were full service refineries that have shut down their crude units, but those shutdowns probably would have happened anyway, and now renewable diesel output is able to soften the blow of that loss. I also got a kick out of O'Leary saying he was going to get a permit and do the right thing for America. There was a refinery proposed back about 15 to 20 years ago by a company called Clean Fuels, and it was going to be built in Yuma, Arizona. It got its EPA air permit. It got the state's air permit. But it just sort of fizzled out. I can't find any record of them announcing they weren't proceeding. They just sort of went away. And these were serious people behind it. Is Kevin O'Leary going to fare better? The U.S. oil market is, like every other country, part of a world oil market, and refineries around the world have been, in, have been expanded. And yet, it's come at the expense of refineries in the U.S. and Europe. But in a market that is so liquid, no pun intended, uh, and with such a free flow of products and crude, making investment decisions based on nationalism is really kind of pointless. ExxonMobil added a quarter million barrels per day in an existing refinery because there were various costs there that are sunk. And they saw an opportunity probably because of the growing U.S. role as a product exporter. But to build a refinery as a total greenfield operation and that has no sunk costs, you think you're going to make it? How come nobody else has tried that? Oh, and one other thing. U.S. peak demand was back in 2019 when for a few weeks it hit 22 million barrels per day. You know what it is now? Closer to 20 million barrels per day. So why, why do we need to build a new refinery from scratch, again, outside of silly nationalism? My guess is that after he gets off TV and sits down and runs the numbers with, uh, with some outside consultants, Mr. O'Leary is going to do the smart thing and say, never mind. The world is not suffering from a shortage of refining capacity. It almost never has. When the choice is economics versus some red meat TV diatribe, economics should win. We'll see if it does. Time to move on here now with Drilling Deep. By the way, I think I'm probably dressed differently now than you just saw me because I'm recording this earlier in the week while at a conference, a freight-related conference in South Carolina, and uh, the first part I recorded later in the week. Anyway, um, you know, it's got a nice lyrical ring to it, ESOP. It stands for Employee Stock Ownership Plan, and it is a method for a company where the owners, are, the, the owners who are selling a company have the company's employees end up as the new owners. It happened recently in the logistics space at a Midwest carrier called Rapid Response, which was sold to its employees. Rapid Response has a long list of clients, including Walmart, Whirlpool, and Dollar General. So when I got the announcement about that sale, I, I was interested in the ESOP and what that means for governance and what it means for the employees. I remember back in the old days when I was writing about steel and the metals business back in the 80s, and there was a company that mostly made a lot of tin plate that I covered, uh, and it was sold as an ESOP. So when I saw it pop up again, it really caught my eye, and I really wanted to talk about it here on Drilling Deep. So the boutique investment company that made that happen is called Butcher Joseph. They specialize in ESOPs. And here to talk to us today about it is from that company, from Butcher Joseph, Alberto Toribio del Pilar. Uh, he has a lot of experience in this space, having worked at Morgan Stanley before Butcher Joseph. And he's here to talk about how an ESOP gets done and what it means. So, Alberto, welcome to Drawing Deep. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having there's, me. There's really two questions, and I'm going to bundle them into one, which is what is an ESOP and what does it mean for rapid response? Like, how did rapid response come to select that method to sell itself uh, rather than something else? I will tell you that I don't recall hearing about a lot of ESOPs in this space. So, this is why it's particularly intriguing. 
how did the process run? And in that and in that answer, you can talk about why an ESOP is good, and I'm sure there's some drawbacks to it. If there weren't any drawbacks, everybody would be doing it. Uh, so, what are the pros and cons? Sure. So, an ESOP, an employee stock ownership plan, is essentially a qualified retirement plan. Uh, it's qualified in the sense that it's you know qualifies for various tax treatments, just like a say like a 401k in many ways. Uh, so, it is a retirement benefit that's that that's you know governed by a plan that in this case, in the case of an ESOP, is overseen by a trustee for the benefit of the participants, which are the employees of the uh, of the retirement plan sponsor, which t- which would be the company. Um, and you know, so what it is essentially, it's a it's a tax advantage uh, structure that allows that provides benefits for both the seller, um, the company as an operating concern, and the employees. Uh, for the seller, it's, um, there's the opportunity to defer capital gains tax on the sale, depending upon the structure of the transaction. Um, there's also that's more kind of qualitative, uh, quant- uh, quantitative. Qualitatively, um, it's kind of a manageable succession plan for a lot of owners. I mean, he, uh, you know, they, it's more of a controlled situation as opposed to an outright sale. And as much as once you sell your company to a third party, you know, they own it, and um, you know things will change. Uh, in the case of an ESOP, while there is a uh, a corporate governance structure. A board that oversees everything, um, it they tend it, it tends not to be that much of a drastic change after after a transaction in terms of governance and operations and what have you. Um, uh, the benefit for the company um, also comes depending upon the structure, but there's um, uh, there's tax deductible contributions that the company can make to this qualified retirement plan, this ESOP, that lowers taxable income. Uh, if you're a taxable company, say a C corporation, and you have an ESOP as a shareholder, uh, and if uh, you're an S corporation, um, basically you and you're owned entirely by the ESOP, uh, which is tax exempt. You're a, you're tax exempt for federal tax purposes as an operating company. If you're um, if you're a company that's a S corporation, it's owned by an ESOP. Um, so that's a key. And for the and for the employees, it's a it's a it's a real retirement benefit. Uh, in as much as it um, it doesn't come out of pocket to them in, in most cases, I think in 99% of cases, the employees don't pay anything um, out of pocket. Um, it's not 100% of the cases. Um, it is uh, based on the value in their accounts are based on um, the value of the business. Um, and so you know, their productivity, their efficiency can be directly correlated to um, you know, uh, valuation. Uh, of which they would benefit uh, because they have an account in that in that plan, and they also have shares in that plan. And each year they get a price, and they understand you know, how much those shares in that account is worth. Um, and then that builds up over time as they stay with the company, and the company grows. Now, let me ask you: Where's the capital involved here in order to pay off the owner? So you say that there's not a big change in ownership. Not not an ownership. There's a big change in ownership, obviously, but there's not a, necessarily a big change in management. So if the Smith family wants to sell its company via an ESOP, how does the Smith family get paid? Uh, well, the capital comes from third parties, um, and, um, and it's, that's where kind of the corporate finance magic uh, comes in in terms of, uh, or analysis really, is understanding the company, underlying company's cash flows, uh, the business cycle, the projections, understanding what kind of capital structure would best fit the business as an employee-owned structure. And usually the th- money comes from a third party in the form of debt. It's the most efficient. If you're going to be an S corporation uh, that's owned by an ESOP, um, you want to be 100% owned by the ESOP. Uh, so there's no there's 100% tax efficiency uh, there. Uh, so usually, any outside capital that we bring in, it will uh, tend to be debt. Um, and so we'll um, go into the cap the debt capital markets, talk to senior lenders that are banks, senior lenders that are not banks, you know, their credit funds, and maybe some junior lenders if. If the uh, you know the cash flows can support it, um, and then the seller usually provides a good portion of the financing in the form of you know seller notes and some other instruments, some other securities that they receive as consideration. And so let's talk about rapid response. Um, the the family that owned it, you can review who that that is, uh, and they went with the ESOP. Now I will tell you that for the last two years running, um, I attended the Benish Private Capital a private equity uh, conference in New York. Basically, they talk about M&A and logistics space. 
And I don't remember ESOPs ever coming up. Maybe they did, and I just wasn't paying attention. But it certainly wasn't a, a key part of the discussion. So here you had a company, a carrier, I guess I'd call them a mid-sized carrier, that wanted to sell. Talk about the process about how they came to an ESOP instead of some other method. Sure. And so for us as a firm, I'll just note, this is probably, I think, our, you know, fourth, fifth, or sixth, thereabouts, I uh, say, uh, trucking-related ESOP transaction. Uh, so we just happened, with, you know, to be working on a fair amount of them, uh, relatively speaking. But I did dig up some numbers from probably what's the best uh, database we have out there from the National Center of Employee Ownership, uh, NCEO, um, with regard to both logistic companies that are ESOP owned or employee owned uh, and or trucking companies. And uh, just to give you a sense, um, there's about a, out of a, there's 129 uh, logistics companies um, uh, that are employee owned out of about probably, uh, I can't remember, it's between anywhere between six or 9,000 uh, uh yeah, about 6,300 ESOP owned companies. Um, so you got about 130 of them are, are in logistics space and about 60 of them you could classify as uh, as, as trucking. Um, and this is, is our, per the database. Um, and in those 60 that are in ESOP owned, there's about almost 23,000 employees that are you know participants in those plans. So you know, not insignificant, but at least as far as those 23,000 you know, ESOP participants are concerned, uh, but, you know, not a huge part of the uh, totality of ESOP owned companies. I think it's about 2% can be classified as transportation companies or logistic companies out of all ESOP owned, and definitely not a lot out of kind of the universe of total companies involved in the logistics space. So what made, what made, what made this company particularly attractive to say, hey, you know what, an ESOP is the way to go here, where maybe another company has come to you in the past and he said, you know what? I don't think an ESOP would work for you, but rapid response, it did. Why? Yeah, well, I think it's more about the desire of a, the owner and what they want to more than likely happen after the transaction. Um, and in this case, uh, there was a real desire to have the next kind of generation of leadership, ownership of the business uh, to come from within uh, the company uh, to to have some of the more longer serving employees who've been there for quite some time benefit from the next phase of growth of the business. Um, and, and he, and this owner in particular didn't want to subject the employees to kind of this uncertainty after a, a sale transaction, uh, didn't want them even come there looking for a job, uh, possibly after a deal. Uh, and so it just felt right for a variety of reasons. I think they had the culture as an organization. Um, present uh, in terms of kind of employee buy-in and uh, engagement, and so it fit well. The ESOP usually fits well with cultures um, like that. Um, it would serve as a competitive advantage for this particular uh, you know company, uh, in as much as you know you want to recruit drivers in this space, you know, company drivers, or you want to recruit personnel. This is a benefit that um, you know not everybody can can offer. Uh, you know. Uh, you know, ownership interest in the business. Uh, uh, so those, I would say, I, I would say, you know, those, that, those are the primary reasons, just to, just the kind of a sense of wanting to do, do well by the folks who've, who've been um, in the business, working diligently and creating value for the last you know, several years uh, and having them, giving them the opportunity to create value and uh, benefit from that going forward. You said the management doesn't really usually change that much. And it's not that much different, but it must be different a little. <laughs> mm -hmm. So for the, in, in the case of, let's say, rapid response, how is their life different now than it might have been previously? Well, there's a, there's a, there's, there will be a, a you know, corporate governance structure uh, that probably before the transaction maybe um, uh, wasn't as defined, um, you know, given it's a, effectively owned by, you know, one person, one family. And uh, I think we'll have a, you know, you know, a board that will kind of oversee the business, like a mini public company, um, with various committees uh, overseeing various areas of responsibility for for members of a board. Um, I think in this instance, there's going to be uh, this opportunity for the 
generate the, the group of management that's been identified as kind of the current group of leadership and then the next generation. And these ESOP structures allow for the creation of management incentive plans alongside the ESOP uh, that usually are, are um, competitive um, relative to what maybe private equity groups might offer a group. And you can kind of provide that benefit to a broader group of people um, within a management group. So so I think there are, um, there's there's kind of a reinforced governance structure. There are clear incentive in place in place for you know successful leadership um, and creation of value. Um, but there aren't any new faces more so than just maybe the trustee, the ESOP trustee. Uh, um, their ESOP trustee's financial advisor, and that's about it, um, really. Now, does that that does that trustee have sort of true independence to act on behalf of the owners who? Or actually the people on the floor? In this case, and in almost all cases, uh, when they're a third-party trustee, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, they, they're a trustee, they, the trustee for the plan, for the trust, um, that kind of oversees the plan. Um, they are, they have the voting power, you know, on behalf of the, uh, uh plan participants, uh, but they're not running the business. They're not in. They're not operators. They're not in the trustees. ESOP trustees are not in the business of running companies, uh, but boards are. You know, boards of directors, boards of advisors, um, and then they have a role. The trustee has a role in kind of helping shape that board. Let's talk about the employees and how they benefit financially. I'm going to throw a theoretical out here. So stop me if this is a ridiculous theoretical. Let's say uh, you know, trucking company. Some young person comes in to work at the dock. Uh, uh, at the age of 20, and then works 20 years. Let's assume the ESOP is in place all that time. And 20 years is a pretty good run. Maybe at the age of 40, they go and decide to do something different. Do they not see any benefit from their ownership until they get to some retirement age, even if they hadn't, maybe at that point, whether it's 60 or 65, whatever, maybe they haven't been at the company since, you know, for 20 years. Um, can they cash out upon leaving, or do they have to wait for that pension payoff that would start at a certain age? Um, so I guess the, the real answer is all depends. Um, the, the pl general plan designs, um, uh, and ERISA, uh, govern a lot of that payout structure. Um, but there is some the leeway for companies to, to operate within those regulations as to how to treat someone like, for example, who's been for in a company for say 20 years is 40 years of age. So he's about, you know, 25 years away from retirement age and about you know, 15 years away from um, what, 50, 55 years of age, which generally triggers kind of diversification events for people with qualified retirement plans um, or withdrawal events. Um, and so what happens generally depends on the size of the account balance and the trajectory of the business basically going forward. Uh, and I'll give you a couple examples. Um, if it's um, not that big of a balance and not that big of a burden. Um, and the employee has separated from the company is working somewhere else and no longer, uh, you know, a member of the, the company. Um, they may get, they may just get their balance paid out to them. Um, and that individual can roll it over into, you know, IRA or 401k or what have you. Um, and they usually get it paid out because, um, it would be, it's generally considered kind of unfair for someone who's not at the business working every day to benefit from creation of value afterward. And so the longer that that former employee is, is in the ESOP plan, the longer they benefit each year that, you know, value is created. So and so does, companies, so sorry. It. So does the company almost encourage that, that worker to cash out? Um, their plan rules. So the company has a, by the rules, they have a certain time period before which they have to cash that individual out. But it's you know the it's a retirement plan, so it's going to be gov it's going to be around certain critical life events, your know, retirement, uh, death, disability, dismemberment. You know before you reach fifty five, which then you get this option of diversifying your account twenty five percent. You know basically each year, uh, and then sixty five when you hit your retirement age. So the company uh, has a lot of leeway, but because they want to make sure that the people at the company are the ones who are going to benefit from that value. Former employees like that tend to get tend to get bought out if it can be if it can be managed. So let, let's let's say this deal. I assume this deal is closed. Okay, so let's say it closed 
first quarter 2023. Um, if somebody there is there 20 years, how do you calculate what their chunk goes in as? So there's, um, you know, there's a couple of pieces to the ESOP plan and there's, um, uh, there's the allocation, uh, and then there's, there's the allocation formula and then there's a vesting formula. Um, uh, generally speaking, um, the allocation of the shares that are kind of released into the, you know, participant accounts, uh, is based on the individual's compensation over or as a percentage of total eligible compensation. For the business as a whole so if he, you know if it's one out of ten it's going to be ten percent you know if you know one out of a hundred it's one percent uh in terms of pay versus total pay um there's also the the opportunity with plan design to create a point system that rewards both you know, level of compensation and time served so you get a certain amount of points for every thousand dollars of compensation or a certain number of points for every year of service and then you can allocate uh, accordingly um, to the plan participants any shares that kind of are released in a given year. Um, then there's vesting, um, and, mo and basically there's two key ways that the plans, you know, the individuals can vest in their accounts. There's three year cliff vesting, and then there's there's five year graded vesting, so one fifth each year uh, before you actually vest in those shares. So those are generally the mechanics that uh, that govern how um, a participant kind of experiences that benefit. Was this your first uh, ESOP in the transportation field, or have you done others previously? We had done, done others previously. Okay. And, and we only got a couple of minutes here. What kind of takeaways would you say if, if you were if you sat down, you had to do an elevator speech with the owner of some kind of logistics company, whether it's a carrier or three PL, whatever? What would you pitch as the primary? I'm kind of coming back to what I said before, but the primary strength and maybe the primary drawback to going to selling out via an ESOP? Uh, there's, there's definitely um, a deal, an ESOP transaction is definitely competitive at, you know, in terms of value potential, especially in this space uh, for any kind of other deal, uh, given the tax benefits that both the seller and the company can benefit from. Um, so that's a real plus, um, and also kind of preserving jobs and, and you know involvement and engagement with the community is also a plus. You know the big drawback is that you know it, it does involve taking on debt if you're going to get some cash at closing. Um, that's not used to operate the business or to grow the business, uh, and so you have to really think carefully about future cash flows. You know what's sustainable. What's not, you know, um, what would be prudent and conservative? Um, um, capex, capital expenditures, your truck, you know, your tractor and uh, a trailer, you know, basically schedule uh, for dispositions and acquisitions, and how that's going to come across. You know, how you're going to treat that versus um, other obligations that you take on as a result of transaction. So it really has to be thought out well um, from a kind of corporate finance cash flow perspective. I think is the drawback. Um, and it takes time, I say, it, you know, it takes time to realize the total value. Um, but you can realize as much or greater value um, uh, uh, relative to a sale to a private equity or strategic, plus you get all these other things around jobs, you know, legacy in your community, benefits for your management team and those have been with you. Yeah, because, I mean, worst case scenario would be if you take on too much debt and it crushes the company, then in any kind of reorganization, the shareholders get wiped out. And in this case, the shareholders on the employees, correct? Uh, the uh, they are, um, um, uh, but there's there's also people. Remember, there's like you know, if there's there's a capital stack, um, if it really gets crushed, you know, everyone who's kind of been in there is going to get feel the pain a little bit, you know, including the seller who's been financing that finance a deal. Uh, but that's the risk business owners have taken. They'll tell you they took that risk for 20, 30 years. And that if you, you know, talk to most business owners, at some point they've had everything riding on the line uh, to keep their business afloat. Uh, and so this, uh, you know, it's it, it goes up and it can go down. Good news is it doesn't come out of the employee's pocket. And, you know, uh, they have a... Um, they ha and the statistics bear out that ESOP-owned companies, employee-owned companies, tend to do better during difficult times. Uh, 
So they tend to uh, perform better. They retain more of their employees, more folks, you know, the folks, they, they tend to take, um, um, have to take less of a pay cut when things go south. So all in, when things do go south, yes, people's equity might get impacted for a given valuation that comes that year or the next. Uh, but this is a retirement plan. You know, you, you know, you have to have a long-term perspective. You have to think like an owner. You have to know that there's an up and there's a down. Well, we want to thank uh, Alberto Toribo del Pilar from Butcher Joseph for talking to us today about ESOP's employee stock ownership plans and the one that he put together with his colleagues at Rapid Response, a Midwest carrier. Alberto, thank you for joining us on Drilling Deep. Thank you, John. It was really a pleasure. So you have been watching Drilling Deep. We are part of the Freightcast family of podcasts from Freight Waves. You can find us on all the leading podcast platforms as well as on Freight Waves TV. I've been your host, John Kingston, and please join us again.